minimally. I'll song lead uh, him. I'm song le leading two things. Okay, let's put. I would say, why don't we put the piano in half stick? Okay. Okay. And put that mic on the other side. That way it'll pick up more voice and piano together. Gotcha. I'm out of bed. Hey. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's what the, I had a friend I worked with, Mr. Larry, he's like 95, uh, retired, but had his office at the flower shop, the family flower shop, so that uh, he could read the funny papers in his office every day. I know, I know. Mr. Larry, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to stop. Really? Yeah. 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 Good morning. Mic check. Good morning all. Nice to see you here on this sunny morning. Hi, Bobby. Okay. Karen, do you want to see that? Good morning. Hi, Eric. Minor, E minor, A minor, B7. That's the whole song. To church one day, for to hear them shout and pray, and to hear the preacher preach the gospel plow. Hold on. Okay. 
Becky, can you like just tap that mic real quick? Just tap it. Okay, cool. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this service of the First Unitarian Church of Toledo. We are people of all ages, people of many backgrounds, and people of many beliefs. We are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. We create spirituality and community beyond boundaries, working from the world. We extend a warm welcome to all of you and an especially warm welcome to those of you that are visiting today. Um, I would like to bring your attention to the cards in the hymn rack in front of you. There's the little yellow card that has um, a place for you to fill out your uh, contact information so that we can send you our weekly e-news, which gives all the little happenings here at church and ways for you to become involved. You are welcome to take the beautiful little quilt uh, card home with you. It has a lot of good contact information for people here at church. And there is also an envelope for donations or for pledges. You are welcome to uh, complete the information on the front and uh, put your donation in here. And we are most grateful for any donations that are made. And lastly, I would like to invite you to Fellowship Hall, which is straight out this door and uh, to your left down the hallway for coffee hour following the service. And now I believe that Tishy has uh, an announcement. So you are welcome to come up, Tishy. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I know that you guys remember when I gave Melissa her stall back in the uh, summertime. I kept thinking, what can I do? Well, there's a lady where I live at. She does a lot of sewing and things like that. So I was able to earn something else similar to what Melissa, what I gave to Melissa. So I decided that I wanted to write something. I'm going to do this very quickly. Uh, it, this is what I said. In my great, I'm very grateful today for one of your oldest members, Eva Slauson. She literally taught me so much about being a good woman, a good friend, and a good person in general. Eva bringing me to her church, now my church, opened my mind to learn so many things, and I thank you guys so very much. Can you believe it? I'm even starting to love myself, and all of you guys are so, so much. I haven't stopped reading yet, 
I'm, I'm learning and yearning for more, okay? Finally, for so long, I searched for life's meaning. And by the world and by, and by my greed, then I did the doors of my freedom was opened by love and I changed since I came here and I genuinely care about everyone here everyone here and I'm glad that because of you all of you all I was able to trade the shackles of my feet now where I live and I'm able to do chores and, and my best buddy has her own sewing room in her apartment and so I couldn't think of nothing better to make than stoves for all the lay ministers and there was absolutely no way I would forget about the flower lady. The beautiful colors, designs are wonderful that all that, that she's letting us have in the front of the church every Sunday. I really miss that throughout this epidemic to see the flowers and how she designed them. My, I even fast and prayed while we were out of church for our pastor and his family. May God bless and keep us all in his care. And so this one right here, I had made, this one is for the flower lady. Is she here and here? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yes, I did. Yay. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> She's coming back. That's beautiful. I want to see the flower again. <laughs> Okay. Oh, here's the case. Okay. 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 No. <laughs> okay. Okay, when I came back to church after my illnesses, had he showed genuine concern. And I was grateful to him, his wife, and his children. When he told me about becoming a layman minister, I was so very proud of him. And every time I saw him, I asked him how was things going. And not, and not only that, I have really enjoyed watching his wife and all of her creativity with the flowers. And I will never forget this, this wonderful church for the kindness, the love, the friendship, and that you all have given to me. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and a great day for everyone else. But for David, you'll always be my friend, always. May God bless us all. I got yours right here. <laughs> You're welcome. Wow. Look at yours. Wow. That is springy. Oh. We'll just put it on. Oh, and it's got chalices on it. Both have chalices. Yeah. Being Unitarian. Yeah. Let me just put that on. Oh, nice. Oh. Beautiful. 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 And then you can take those pages oh, out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that. Oh, it's all about <laughs> well, that was totally unexpected. Thank you, Tishy. Very thoughtful.
Thank you, Tishy. Thank you. Our opening words today are by Elizabeth Mount, co-regulation. From our very first breath, we reach out co-regulation, not self-regulation, is in our nature. We find our cues from the sun and the moon, from each parent and caregiver. We find our place in this great turning planet by turning to one another, generation to generation. We awaken to the dawn and fall asleep at the evening's end. Our life's journey is part of something greater, something simple, something divine. A flame cannot be lit without a spark. A life cannot begin without the air. And we cannot begin to find ourselves without love. May we reach out to one another. May we offer love and nurturing care. May we join together in celebration of the interdependence of our lives. In this spirit, let us worship together. Our chalice lighting today was written by Claudine Oliva. We light this chalice for mothers and mothering to celebrate those who have taken on the task of nurturing a young one, whether a baby, a child, or a youth, into adulthood. To celebrate those who have nourished the light of truth and compassion in growing minds and hearts. To celebrate those who have committed time, money, energy to the growth of others in this world. We light this chalice to celebrate and hold dear this flame of love. Please join me in reciting the covenant of this church as printed in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Please join me in hymn number 399, Vine and Fig Tree. This is in your gray hymnal, 399. And everyone beneath the vine and fig tree shall live in peace and unafraid. And everyone I'll invite Jenny to the podium at this point to share the story of our future. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jenny Gottman. I'm our new Director of Lifelong Learning. I have been a Unitarian Universalist for about 17 years. Raise your hand if you started coming to a UU church because you had a baby. I had a baby. I thought it would benefit her to have some exposure to people she didn't know, new strangers, and a community of adults who would care about her. 
I myself did not come from a very religious family, but I had been to church a few times. I had memories of going to the nursery, eating graham crackers and singing One Tin Soldier, and I thought that had value. So when I had my child, my general vague intention in attending church was to take her where the kids go, question mark, leave that place, go to grown-up church, and my husband and I would think our deep grown-up thoughts. I didn't intend to teach children any more than I intended to fly to the moon. They say that the way to make God laugh is to make a plan. One average Sunday, my board president approached me in a mild panic and told me that our kids' program at church had fallen apart. Every adult in charge of it was mad at every other adult. <laughs> And could I take the lead? <laughs> no, 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 I could not. But when your board president looks you in the eye and asks you to do this, you're in a corner and you say yes. I quickly learned that most of the adults in my church thought the way that I initially thought. They would no more teach kids than they would fly to the moon. People in church tend to assume that the children's program is the responsibility of the parents and the teachers in the congregation. This is why that's wrong. The teachers in the congregation teach five days a week. They don't want to teach on Sundays. It seems obvious. I didn't get it until it was spelled out to me. Second, the parents. The kids in the congregation are not enriched by seeing their own parents every Sunday. They don't enjoy it, the parents don't love it, and it confers no special benefit on the kids. This is the unpleasant truth. My own child stopped coming to church because she didn't want or need to see any more of me than she already did. And there were no other adults in the church doing the job. Her church community, my church community, absolutely failed her. Another unpleasant truth was that in the same church where I had taken the reins, our most devoted non-parent volunteer, Susan, gave us an average of two hours per year. We gave her an award. That is also truly a failure on the part of the church. There is no other way to put it. A church that doesn't prioritize its children is a church that, it's on its way, that is on its way to being a memory. It's a church that is pulling the ladder of faith and community up behind it. Here's the good news. Good news number one. Those two hours a year that Susan gave, they were genuinely fun and easy. There are two adult volunteer days that I want to tell you about. One was Susan's. One Sunday, for an hour, she brought in her pet frog, Carmen, and told the kids what it is like to have a frog. She would look in the cage and she would say, I love you, Carmen, and Carmen would just shiver. <laughs> Who knew that frogs would do that? Another volunteer was our building and grounds captain, John. John was a master gardener in Arkansas, and one Sunday he walked the kids and me around our property, which he had basically designed himself, and identified the trees and shrubs that he had planted, which flowers like to be in the sun and in the shade, and what soil erosion looks like when you see it with your own eyes. Susan and John didn't need to stay up late at night planning. They probably didn't do any planning at all. The kids would probably have never met another adult who had a pet frog, and they would not have gotten a tutorial from a master gardener. Their lives were enriched by the adults in the congregation who just talked about the things that they liked. Good news number two. If you have no idea what you would say to a child, I am here for you. It's literally my job. I will find you stories, projects, games, songs, supplies. You will not have to do any research or any stressful planning. I will wrap everything you need up in a bow and place it gently in your arms. You will not have to worry at all. If you think of volunteering as the eating your vegetables of church life, I will be making the proverbial airplane noises to make it all go down easily. <laughs> Good news number three. Kids are legitimately funny and fun. And right now, our plan is just for our kids to have fun. 
They need each other and their church community right now more than they need to hear lessons about our principles. What that means is that within reason, anything goes. Do you like to craft? Come and craft. Do you have a tarantula? Bring her in. Do you practice yoga? Come practice yoga. I have meditated in a parking lot with three boys under the age of 10. I have been blindfolded and spun in circles. I've had children change their names for gender reasons. I also had a girl who changed her name to a sound effect and a boy who only wanted to be called LeBron Flames. You cannot make this up and you will not get this quality content from the adults in your lives. <laughs> Good news number four, if you are child phobic, if the thought of talking with a child genuinely makes you hyperventilate, welcome to our committee. We are all adults and we are nice. We have fun and our meetings are efficient. Talk to me, Sandra, or Arun about it. So when you see me coming toward you with a clipboard, or when you see some random number from Arkansas pop up on your phone, do not worry. Don't scramble for an excuse or another cup of coffee. I am not asking you to do anything for me. This is for the future of our church and our church community. This church was here for all of us when we were looking for truth and meaning, and Lord knows we need it today. I don't know if I could have gotten through the past week standing on my own two feet if it weren't for my community. It is now our job to make it not just available, but vibrant, thriving, and fun for those who come after us. Come, come, whoever you are, come, yet again, come. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Mickey. Uh, that was a tradition that we used to have before COVID, where uh, we would sing the children out to uh, religious education. So it's nice that we can resume that. So I have a meditation prayer that I will read in a minute. But first, I want to comment on the news of the week. Earlier this week, Politico published a draft decision by the United States Supreme Court, which appears to overturn Roe versus upper, upending nearly 50 years of access to abortion. Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, released a statement to address the heartache, anxiety, and outrage that many folks may be feeling. I encourage you to check our church website for the full statement or to go to uua.org for the statement. But I'll just read a couple excerpts here. Reverend Frederick Gay Gray writes, we greatly fear that this decision will justify efforts to further limit the rights of women and other vulnerable populations in this country. We know the most damaging effects will be felt by people of color, young people, poor and working class people and those living in rural areas. All who even today do not have ready access to comprehensive and equitable reproductive health care. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe that all bodies are sacred. Every person has the right to determine if, when, and how they want to have children. Unitarian Universalism proclaims that all individuals and communities have the right to self-determination, safety, and the resources that are necessary for health and sustainability. We will continue to work for those most impacted by this harmful decision. So I'd like to share this prayer written by the Reverend Evan Carvel Zemer. 
Evan is a member of the Central East Region field staff for the Uni Unitarian Universalist Association. Evan fostered a number of children before Evan and her partner had their own children. And Evan spent a lot of time working in the youth program in this, uh, in this part of the country. So I really uh, value her opinion and her thoughts. Her prayer, honoring the deeper voices. Spirit of life, today the advertising tells us what to buy for mom. Instead, help us listen to and honor the deeper voices. Today, let us honor those who have made this world possible for us. Those who did the hard work of building a better world for future generations. Today, let us honor the grief of those who have lost children through miscarriage, stillbirth, death, those who long for children, and those who for whatever reason cannot be in touch with their children this day. Today, let us honor the grief of those who mourn for their parents, whether separated by death, dementia, or disconnection. Today, let us honor those who fill in for missing mothering, fathers, grandparents, foster parents, aunts and uncles, and more. Today, let us honor the ways we have each been nurtured and mothered by the mothers who gave birth to us, by the parents who raised us, by many others who have supported and nurtured us of all genders. Today, let us honor those who survived damaging and traumatic mothering. Spirit of life, help them to heal. Let us remember that not every mother is ready for her children. Let us turn aside from the myths of motherhood on a pedestal. And remember, each parent is an imperfect human in need of more support than adulation, in need of our support. Today, let us honor those who are doing the hard work of nurturing, striving to meet not only the physical needs, but the many deep and complicated emotional and spiritual needs. Spirit of life, nurture and sustain them so they may be nurturers you desire. Today, let us honor all the ways each of us give to tomorrow, knowing there are multiple paths of meaning and more than one way to birth the future. Today, with both joy and sorrow, let us be grateful for life, for the chance to love, for those who love us, and the opportunity to nurture the future. Let us reflect and have a minute of silence.
Hallelujah. After hearing that old spiritual, hallelujah, seems like the appropriate response. Hallelujah for resuming in-person worship services. I had the idea for this service three years ago, but COVID intervened. I knew I had to do this service in person with live music, so I just had to be patient. Hallelujah for our technical team. We have Walter and Eric and Krista and Patrick. Thank you all. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Hallelujah is also the appropriate response for this spring weather. For the flowers emerging from the ground and for those warblers and other birds migrating through Ohio. But springtime also means that there is important work to do. It is time to plow the fields, to prepare them for planting and raising crops that will be needed to feed and nourish us. Since only 2% of Americans are farmers, I doubt that many of us are actually plowing fields this spring. Nevertheless, I suspect that most of us are familiar with plowing, perhaps because our parents or grandparents were farmers, or perhaps because farming is an integral part of our history and culture. The song that Melissa sang is known as Gospel Plow, or Keep Your Hands on the Plow, or just Hold On. Since it cannot be attributed to a specific songwriter or composer, it is a type of folk song. The first published reference to Gospel Plow comes from a 1917 collection of songs entitled English Folk Songs from the Southern Appalachians, Volume 2. The author, Cecil Sharp, was an English-born folk song collector and musician. He spent many weeks traveling through those remote regions and collected hundreds of songs and tunes. He assumed that all those songs originated in England and had been preserved in those valleys and villages secluded from industrialized or urban areas. Although Sharp made a valuable contribution by documenting all those songs that might have otherwise been lost, historians later criticized him for his sexist and racist attitudes. They concluded that those attitudes influenced his works. For example, he downplayed the influence of women in music. He ignored the contribution of ethnic Scots in his earlier collection of folk songs from England and he made disparaging comments in his diary that people of color had not to contribute musically. With the benefit of hindsight, his assumption of white English cultural superiority is obvious. Let's hope that we can learn from this example to be more aware of our own assumptions or biases. Two decades after Sharp's book, the American folklorist Alan Lomax recorded Keep Your Hands on the Plow, sung by Elihu Trusty, an African-American man from Paintsville in eastern Kentucky. According to Lomax, Hold On was a hymn of the Holiness Church, also sung as a Negro spiritual. Lomax further explained, Holiness preachers frankly tell their congregations that they want them to have a good time. Musical instruments, from fiddles to saxophones, are played in the church, and the hymns sung are the liveliest of revival tunes, Negro and white. As, Al, as Lomax said, like the rural Negro church services, the holiness meetings are a sort of American folk theater. Additional early recordings, such as Keep Your Hand on the Plow by the Hall Johnson Negro Choir, confirmed that gospel plow was deeply embedded in the African-American spiritual tradition. The initial misattribution of gospel plow is not an uncommon story. Many early music recordings from rural Appalachia were songs that had arisen from a history of interracial collaboration. But the commercial record companies, who were motivated to maximize profits rather than to document cultural history, segmented the market by race. They sold hillbilly or country music to white customers and race records, which we call blues or spirituals, 
to African American customers. This amoral business practice had the unintended consequence of segregating musicians and listeners by race rather than building a wider community through the power of shared music. As the preacher today, I would like to fulfill the words of the holiness spiritual by plowing that gospel plow. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that I have a clear understanding of that phrase, gospel plow. I do know that the metaphor originated in the Bible, specifically in the Gospel of Luke. At the beginning of chapter 9, we learned that Jesus had called the 12 apostles together and sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey. You may have heard that line in the chorus. The story continues later in chapter 9. As they were walking along the road, Jesus said to a man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. To paraphrase the website Becoming Christian, for a plowman to be successful in his work, he must concentrate on the job he started. He knows that the only way is forward, not being distracted by the things left behind. If the plowman starts to look back, his plow line could become crooked. If that happens, the field he is plowing will not yield a full harvest. Thus, when plowing, you need to choose a point at the other end of the field and head towards it. The implication is that heaven or personal salvation is that point at the other end of the field. Look ahead to that point. Don't look back at worldly temptations or even worldly concerns. As a song created collectively, there are many verses. I did find one verse with some relevance to Mother's Day and which highlights the uh, theme. I got a mother in the promised land, never shall rest till I shake her hand. Keep your hand on that gospel plow. Then there's a reference to a specific mother, which you may have caught. Mary wore three links of chain. Every link was Jesus' name. Keep your hand on that plow. Bob Dylan's 1961 version of Gospel Plow started with that verse. I have to admit that the meaning of that verse is just as obscure to me as many of other Dylan's other lyrics. <laughs> In any case, Carefully parsing the language of gospel plow verses, looking for consistent or unambiguous interpretations may be a distraction because this hymn came from the holiness tradition where emotional expression was the key to the worship experience. The words reference biblical stories and characters that were well known to the congregation. So such verses had impact on the participants. As gospel plow became better known via commercial recordings and live performances, folk singers found new variations of this metaphor and created more verses. During World War II, gospel plow was transformed into a political song by a group called the Union Boys. This high-powered group consisted of black and white blues and folk musicians, which included Josh White, Brownie McGee, Sonny Terry, Burl Ives, Pete Seeger, and the folklorist Alan Lomax. They recorded several labor-oriented songs in the studio, but never performed publicly as a group. Their sole record album, entitled Songs for Victory, included a version of Hold On with new words referring to the need for solidarity in the struggle against fascism and to support the formation of the United Nations. The message changed from keep the faith to keep up the fight. As one verse goes, 
United Nations made the chain. Every link is freedom's name. Keep your hand on that gun. Hold on. Now freedom's name is mighty sweet. Black and white is going to meet. Keep your hand on that gun. Hold on. You heard that right. The refrain changed from keep your hands on the plow to keep your hand on the gun. The chorus repeated the names of the leaders of four countries that were allied against Nazi Germany and Hirohito's Japan. Hold on, Franklin D. Hold on, Winston C. Hold on, Chiang Kai-shek. Hold on, Joseph Stalin. Including Stalin's name, at least in hindsight, kind of diminishes the power of that phrase, every link is freedom's name. Nevertheless, the end of the final, ver the final verse envisioned an optimistic future with a bit of a whimsical political ending. After this war is over and done, going to catch my bus and have some fun. Going to get me a gal who sure can twist and who ain't isolationist. It is just as well that hold on to your gun did not stand the test of time. Fortunately, as we will soon hear, other musicians continued creating new verses as well as a better refrain. Gospel Plow was recorded in the 50s and 60s by well-known artists, including Mahalia Jackson, Pete Seeger, and Odetta. Later in the 90s and the 2000s, um, Sweet Honey and the Rock and Bruce Springsteen recorded it. Along the way, the civil rights movement grabbed onto the song. In 1960, Guy Carawan was the music director and a song leader at the Highlander School, a training center for activists in Tennessee. In that role, Guy advocated that the usage of religious and folk music could shape movements and influence people to take action in social change. Guy also taught classes in adult literacy and often brought his guitar to his classes. On one occasion, he was in an, on an island off the coast of South Carolina playing Hold On when Alice Wine, an African-American farmer's wife from a remote part of the island, approached him and said, I know a different echo to that. And by echo, she meant a refrain or a chorus. She then proceeded to sing a version of Hold On and replace the refrain with, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Those words were not present in any of the song transcriptions previously cataloged by folklorists. In 1960 then, Guy Carawan made a field recording of Alice Wine, singing the song with her echo and credited her as the songwriter. Some folks have said that the refrain was probably created by her congregation as a group rather than by Alice Wine on her own, but no other contributors came forward or were identified. As you will hear in our next song, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize opens with a verse transplanted from Gospel Plow, a verse about the biblical characters Paul and Silas, so in the book of Acts, chapter 16, we learn about Paul and Silas. They were first-generation missionaries on the road, evangelizing about the life, death, and acts of Jesus. While preaching and casting out demons in a village in the Roman province of Macedonia, Paul and Silas were accused by a local businessman. These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. So the civil authorities complied and put the two apostles in jail. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. In our song, you will hear the phrase, bound in jail, had no money to go their bail. 
This phrase was especially appropriate as it could just as easily refer to jailed protesters in Birmingham or Selma as it did to Paul and Silas. In the documentary film of the 1963 March on Washington, there is a scene in which a young African-American man sings out a verse and the gathered crowd responds each time by singing the chorus. Keep your eyes on the prize. Just as those holiness congregations were bound together by the call and response of gospel plow, the civil rights movement bonded and gained strength from singing together and from creating music together. If the word spiritual means to recognize a feeling or belief that there is something greater than oneself, then this type of community singing in support of a noble cause is certainly a powerful example of spirituality. Our, uni our universalist ancestors taught that we are all bound for heaven, even if we are agnostic or atheist. So if personal salvation is not the guidepost at the end of our row, what is the prize that we are striving to obtain? Perhaps our prize is the beloved community that Martin, Reverend Martin Luther King described, where reconciliation prevails rather than bitterness or emptiness, where justice prevails rather than economic exploitation or political oppression. Perhaps our prize is encapsulated in our sixth principle, which states, we affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And if we don't accept particular holy scriptures as our implement, what is our plow? I suggest we look to our principles again. In the current political climate where voting rights are under attack, the fifth principle seems like a good plow. We affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process in society at large. So friends, hold on, because we still have some plowing to do. We need to plow for voting rights, and along the way, we need to pull up the weeds of lies which have led to fear and hostility. And we need to keep plowing for reproductive rights and reproductive justice. We may feel discouraged because it seems that this row has been plowed before, but that is the thing about farming. You have to plow every season. So we know it need to join together this season with our religious and secular allies to keep working the field. Blessed be and amen. I think I said something in that sermon, Melissa, about the value of singing together. Yes. Yes. Just sing together. I hope you'll join in, <laughs> join in on the chorus. You'll catch on. Paul and Silas bound in jail had no money for the go there.
The words for the offering are by John Saxton, adapted. This religious community exists by its mission as a fire exists by burning, but a fire cannot burn without fuel. And it is the time, the energy, the imagination, the vision, the creativity, the compassion, the love, and the financial support of the members and friends of this community that fuels our mission of fostering spiritual growth and compassionate action. Your support, the free and generous support of each and every member and friend of this community is what fuels this community and its mission. And without your support, the flame of justice, community, and love cannot burn brightly to warm ourselves and be a beacon in a world threatened by division and fear. You are invited to give electronically by going to our website, uutoledo.org, and clicking Give, and then following the prompts. You are also welcome to mail a check to us at the First Unitarian Church of Toledo, 3205 Glendale Avenue, Toledo, 43614. Or if you are here in person, you're invited to place your contribution in the basket as you leave the sanctuary today. And we are most grateful for your contributions. For our coming soon, next Sunday at 945, Spiritual Adventures will take place live in Fellowship Hall. And next Sunday for the 11 a.m. service, um, which will be live and on YouTube, Reverend Tim will present the topic of VSAC. VSAC is the celebration of the birth, the enlightenment, and the death of the Buddha. And after today's service, you are invited to Fellowship Hall to uh, chat, to have coffee or tea, and enjoy this beautiful spring morning. And now our closing words into the World Singing by Dawn Sky Cooley. Let us go out into the world singing. Let us go out into the world singing songs that procre proclaim liberty, songs that turn ashes into garlands, songs that bind up the afflicted and those who mourn, Songs that, like oaks, have roots that go deep and stand strong. Let us go out into the world singing. We know these songs. They vibrate time in our very souls. They are the songs that give us life. The songs that give us... They are the songs that give us purpose. Now it is our turn to take these life-giving songs out into the world. Let us go now singing these songs with voices deep and strong. And may the world join us in praise and in celebration and in love. Amen. Amen. As Karen extinguishes the flame, I'll share these words. Let this chalice be our beacon at the end of the row, that it may illuminate our vision of a democratic society with civil rights and liberty and justice. And let us hold on to our principles, 
that they may guide our actions in this spiritual work. As we go into the world singing, please turn to 395. We'll play once and do it as a round. I'd also like to take this opportunity while you're flipping through uh, to let you know you should say happy birthday to a couple of people at coffee hour. I believe Melissa and Bobby will have birthdays this week. So make sure you go say hi. Oh. 